Well, welcome to the very first episode of Crosstalks, a live broadcast talk show from two of Sweden's leading universities, KTH, that's the Royal Institute of Technology, and Stockholm University. We are coming to you live from the library at KTH, located in the heart of Stockholm. My name is Johanna Koljonen, and tonight, today, or this morning, depending on where you are, we've gathered some of the leading professors in Sweden to talk about globally relevant topics. The professors will be in this room, other thought leaders will be Skyping in to take part in the conversation, and we also hope to hear from you, the viewers watching online. At the end of each session, you will have a unique opportunity to ask questions of our guests. Please do this by calling in on Skype. Our alias is Crosstalks TV. Crosstalks TV is also our Twitter alias, and our hashtag is Crosstalks. After each talk, the professors will be available on the crosstalks.tv website to chat with you. And now, if you've already forgotten everything I just said, don't worry. Everything you need to participate is explained on crosstalks.tv. During this three-hour broadcast, we will cover saving the world, fixing capitalism, and first, we'll talk about entrepreneurs. So let's get started. In the last few decades, the entrepreneur has become a hero and a role model. Politicians in particular bask in the glory of the individual who've made it, who've identified an opportunity, innovated a solution, thrived in a cutthroat market or created their own. If only all citizens were more like them, so say our leaders, then our nations as well as our citizens would be richer, safer and more dynamic. But with all nations racing for the same goal, are there enough entrepreneurs and innovators to go around? How do we attract them, grow them and keep them? And more importantly, is the entrepreneur who made it big and has the homes and jets to prove it really the hero our age requires? Are the wealth builders also future builders? And what do their successes mean for the rest of us? To discuss these issues today, please welcome three eminent scientists who all also are or have been successful entrepreneurs in the private sector. Terence Brown, Associate Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Welcome. Thank you. Karin Badilund, Associate Professor at the Stockholm University School of Business and Director for Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship. Welcome. Thank you. And Mats Danielsson, Professor in Physics at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. Warm welcome to our guests. <laughs> Terence Brown, you were one of the founders of the peer-reviewed International Journal for Entrepreneurial Venturing. Now, how close is the academic field's definition of the word entrepreneur uh, to the general understanding of what this uh, word means? Good question. Uh, let me give you an academic -y definition of entrepreneurship. The process of coordinating resources to exploit opportunities that exist in the environment or created through innovation in an attempt to create value. Let me say it one more time. Thank the you. process of coordinating resources to exploit opportunities that exist in the environment or created through innovation in an attempt to create value. Now, there are lots of $100 words in there, so let me break it down. It's basically a process that delivers value to a customer, and by doing that, solves their problem, cures their pain, or satisfies their need. So if you look at that, it's very close to the common definition of what entrepreneurship is. The slight difference is, is that most academics have a more broad uh, view towards entrepreneurship. For example, it could be about a startup, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be in a large firm, it can be in an old firm. It could be dealing with creating value, as in social value, or it could be creating value as in financial value, or in creating a, a, a journal, which is an example of academic yeah. entrepreneurship. Is, yeah. For me as an entrepreneur, I think that uh, definition is a little bit too long. I would cut it short. I would say an entrepreneur want to make money and solve problems. How, how is, is an entrepreneur a synonym to a business owner? It could be. Uh, I think that entrepreneurship is about a process. And this process can, as I said, take place in a, in a small firm or a small firm or a large firm. Uh, I think that uh, most, people, most, most uh, people do link 
ownership with the entrepreneurial process, mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. Karin, Marilyn, you've said that you'd like to have a broader definition of entrepreneur. Now, why do you stress that? This sounded pretty broad to me. Yeah, it, I think it's broad. I mean, if, if you just start up with this process talk that's about entrepreneurship and how entrepreneurial processes are interest, of interest to study, uh, but if we look at the language we have of entrepreneurs, it's about the entrepreneur. I mean, it's a, it's a language of the person, of the individual in this society. And yeah. this individual is not, you know, anyone. It's the hero that you talked about in the beginning. And um, if we recall the hero, I think it can be, you know, we need to have a language for also other heroes or heroines, <laughs> for instance. And that's also what we, we have seen now, that we have heroes in, in different sectors, in the public sector, in the school. You know, you should, you know, teach... Uh, entrepreneurship in school today, it's in the curriculum. So we can see entrepreneurship appearing basically everywhere in contemporary society. So really entrepreneur has, the word has become synonymous with, which, with any kind of individual doing good things. Yeah, I think the word has become synonymous with how we perceive of human being today, that we should be entrepreneurial. That's how we think about ourselves. You're an, a teaching of entrepreneurialism, but you don't seem completely convinced. Should we all be entrepreneurs? Um, I think that's not up to me to judge, but we can have a mirror where we can mirror our own society and to see if we should all be entrepreneurial, then uh, what's it, what, what is at stake here and then in relation to the society. And what does that make the employees? Because I'm assuming we're still going to need those. So that, that's interesting. Are they all non-heroes? Then there's a narrative shift somehow from the collective to the individual that's happened somewhere in the last few years. I have a question for you, Mats. You were one of the founders of Sektra Mamea, a company in the field of breast cancer diagnostics, which has proprietary, had pr proprietary technology based in part on your physics research. Now, how much of a conflict do you perceive between your role as a scientist serving the collective, as it were, and your role as an entrepreneur? I think in the two roles, you want to do something good, genuinely. Genuinely, you really want to do that. So I don't see a conflict of interest. I think a difference is that as a scientist, you can be a little bit more crazy because you don't risk that your employees will be out of work and your company will be bankrupt. OK. Did, why, did you, why did you decide to, to develop Sector Mame as a company instead of, of staying in the academic field, or keeping it as a purely academic pro project? Well, I, I wanted to, to do something to, to, to uh, solve what I thought was an important problem, uh, breast cancer. A lot of young women are dying from breast cancer, so I wanted to help there. Uh, and I wanted to get rich together with my, my friends. And uh, it was four reasons, so that was two reasons. The, the third reason was... Uh, uh, now I forgot that. I, I only remember two reasons. <laughs> <laughs> th those were clearly the, the most important ones. But, but it's interesting, it's very refreshing that you say out loud. No, the third one was that we wanted to beat the competition, for sure. We really mm. wanted to beat the big companies, show, show, show that we could do this so much faster, quicker and better and smarter. I'm, but I'm really impressed that you said you wanted to get rich. Uh, because, of course, that's somewhere a choice. All of you are, are, have, are, have one foot in academia and, and, and another in the private sector. But still, there is a choice where... Obviously, you're not going to be making very much money in, in the academic sector, and that's great. But is it uh, far be it from me to say that you don't deserve the money you earn? Uh, but but isn't, is there some kind of idea where, where you get judged on that uh, by your academic peers at all? It used to be something very bad to ma make money as a professor or be involved in companies, but that has really switched, yeah, as we heard so. here before. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, accepted and it's more like a merit, I would say. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at success, I'm curious, uh, curious about how we measure success in entrepreneurs uh, today, because we use, like historically, we have been most impressed with empire builders, so entrepreneurs who create big legacy companies, which will be there for generations, uh, typically become inherited by their children and maybe even run by them, uh, and, and frankly, that produce a lot of jobs. And now, I think, just from the media, it looks like a lot of the, the hero entrepreneurs, uh, like an equally valid way of being a success is just making a very lucrative exit after a few years. When did this change happen? What happened there? 
Exits sure. have always been interesting because it's a, a one-shot deal in a, in a very short time frame where people can presumably make a lot of money. So they've always, always been hot. But I think especially in the internet boom time in the um, mid to late 90s, when the amount of money was so enormous and the time so quick that it made really good news. Mm -hmm. And because it made really good news, news people wanted to report it. And I think that the, the legacy of that is still with us. Mm -hmm. Did how do others feel about this idea of, of, of making the money fast and, and moving on? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I, I think for real entrepreneurs, the money are just part of the story. And the most important thing is to solve a problem they think is really important. Yeah, well, I, think that the, I think that that's true. I think that you, if you speak to, uh, to, to successful entrepreneurs, many of them will say that money is just a way that we keep score. Mm. And they actually really mean that in that the, the, the money that they make is an indication of the problems that they solve. And the more problems they solve, the more successful they are. Okay, let me ask you this. Are businesses that are created as investments qualitatively different from businesses that are, are to grow organically and to plan to stick around for a long time? Karin, you seem to be nodding. Uh, no, I, I just thought about another thing. Can I, can I bring it up? <laughs> bring it up. <laughs> okay, I thought about this guest lecture we had last week and uh, we were discussing this about you know making money and it was about venture capitalists who just you know make their exit when they decide to go out so mm -hmm. if they don't have made enough of money they go out anyway and they leave the innovation mm -hmm. so that's also an aspect uh, in relation to entrepreneurship this is not just you know one individual but this individual is part of a bigger relationships and with other companies and organizations. So um, I would like to stress the link to the financial sector and how that has an impact on how entrepreneurship is organized yeah, in different sectors. Because venture capitalists, of course, are also entrepreneurs, except that they're... Yes. That they're but whose job is it then to, be, to think long term in, in companies like this? What's I think it's everybody's responsibility. And I think it is a difference for a company to grow organically. I think that's by far the best way. That's the preferred way for all entrepreneurs. It's only when that is not possible, which is in a quite, quite a few cases, it's, it's just not doable. Then you have to go to somebody to ask for the money. Isn't anybody going to defend venture capital, Terence? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> It's an honor <laughs> it can be an honorable profession. Uh, I'm a member of the Swedish and the Danish Venture Capital Association, so they're, uh, they're good people. I think they're in the middle of uh, trying to find the right business model uh, to make it work, because the, the interests of the venture capitalists uh, often conflict with the interests of the entrepreneur, because most venture capitalists raise money uh, from uh, institutions, and then they invest that money in your business. And so while it might be beneficial for you to uh, grow market share, for example, and not profits, the VC needs to make an exit. Hmm. The VC is fiduciarily and legally responsible, not to your business, but to his investors. So when it comes down to making a decision, they may often fall back to their investors rather than you and leave you out in the cold. And so that creates this conflict. And if the exit is uh, um, an IPO, so that so that the company goes public, mm -hmm. then again there are shareholders to be responsible to. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's again the the, the long term thinking. I mean, I, I wonder that's a layman's question, but whose job is it actually in an, in a company? Is it is it the board of directors? Is it who is meant to be keeping the the eye on the on the horizon? Is it the CEO? Is it really the owners? But what if the owners are just faceless capital? Whose job is it? Yeah, I mean, it is, the, it is the, the, the shareholders through the board of directors that's uh, legally supposed to make these long-term these long decisions. Do they? Hmm. Sometimes. But I think everybody is really responsible. The, the, the board of directors, but also the management team, and actually all employees. I mean, people always so ask us as scientists, why are you a scientist? But then you can ask, like, why do you work at Ericsson? Mm -hmm. why do you, you have to, that's a question you, you should be able to answer whatever you do. So I think everybody is responsible for the long time Okay, so everybody vision. is responsible. Let's, let's rephrase that. Hmm. Are everybody being responsible? No, I mean, I think everybody has a role to play. I think how you organize your, your company, and perhaps your company's culture, from coming from you and your partners, instilled this long-term view 
on the employees, but many people don't do that. So I think you're absolutely correct. We have this responsibility, perhaps, but many people do not uh, take it up. Do you agree with this fundamental tenet of, of our leaders today that entrepreneurs produce growth? We don't want to produce any growth. We don't care about that. We want to solve a problem, something that is important. We want to help the humanity. We want us to do something. We want to, to save the world. Maybe we don't need the next, sex, uh, next session, actually. We, we, we solve it right here now. <laughs> so <laughs> and we, we want also to save want to get rich a little. Doesn't that mean? Doesn't that mean? I mean, that's also growth, but it's good for you, maybe. Growth is a side effect yeah. that may happen. But we want to do something good. Growth, what does that mean? To me, nothing. To most entrepreneurs, I think, nothing. With the both of you are also entrepreneurs. Mm. Do you want to produce growth? Do you produce growth? Well, I, I want to solve problems. And, and in solving problems, if I do a good job in solving problems, I'll create value for the customers. If I create value for customers, I create value for owners, me. Mm -hmm. And by creating value for owners and value for customers, I create value for society. So Karin, you look amused. Well, we talk about growth. We could talk about uh, societal development, for instance, which is a much and broader concept. And uh, I think that it depends on which, which people we call entrepreneurs here. Mm -hmm. So if, if we look at the successful people, then we can have a link to growth. But if we look at the whole, you know. Mm. I, I think I, I worry that... W Again, as a layman, it would seem that when, when uh, new innovations produce new companies, other companies are simultaneously, and other business models are being driven out of the market. So you would assume that that's, uh, you know, that some people, somewhere else, some other companies are going bust. Does it really, like scientifically speaking, do you feel that it's true that, that, that having more startups and having more new companies, entrepreneurially driven, innovative companies, actually on average does produce growth? Is that even a fact? Well, that's how capitalism is working. At least I thought so as a physicist. <laughs> Maybe I didn't read the books, but <laughs> if somebody, else, somebody is doing a better job, then he should do the job. And those poor guys will probably fire back and do something else. Creative destruction. I mean, that's, that's the, 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 the value and the, and the money will go to those who are making better use of it. So when, yeah. And that's where we can see these other forms uh, emerging, like social entrepreneurship, where I don't think we can talk about, you know, money in, in that respect, but it's more about social impact. So that's another way to discuss entrepreneurship today. Isn't social entrepreneurship something that other kinds of entrepreneurs like to put on the table so that we look the other way and not wholly responsible? Yes. <laughs> in, in CSR, perhaps, and sometimes. It's CSR called, is, yeah, you know, corporate social. Washing or something like that. But yeah. it's also, you know, seriously, people out there trying to solve societal problems okay, with let, new means. Let's look at what the politicians mean, though. So when politicians talk about helping entrepreneurs, what do they mean? Do they just mean they want to create jobs in the private sector? In the US, for example, uh, they're looking for uh, votes. They're looking actually for uh, tax base. So they're looking for value creation to increase the tax base. Mm. And they're looking for potential donors. Ah. In, in Sweden, it's mostly jobs. In Sweden, it's mostly jobs. But is that, does that make sense? It doesn't make sense from my perspective, because uh, if, if I'm teaching entrepreneurship, uh, the last thing I'm going to tell you to do is hire people. <laughs> yeah, it, it would seem that this, this whole process of, of, of making sure that everybody wins financially somewhere doesn't involve, doesn't involve that. So we're, the politicians are indirectly appealing for people to either make it into the middle class or ascend beyond the middle class. It's about individual financial gain. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, Matt. I think that, uh, the, the, again, the money, I think, is just part of the story. And uh, you really want to do something good and, mm. and to, to, to solve the problem. And also, I think that we don't want everybody to be entrepreneurs. That would be terrible. It would be a terrible world to live in. The, 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 I think the entrepreneurs are kind of difficult actually to deal, deal with now and then. And it's a teamwork, so in a company or in, in an environment, you need different skills. And the entrepreneurial spirit is one. I think if you have too much of that, it will end up with a cat fight or something. Mm. Yeah, I guess I agree. Yeah. yeah, I certainly agree. As I said before, everybody has their role to play. And you, you alluded to this hero sort of thing. And uh, the press likes to focus on individuals. But the nature of entrepreneurship today is that it's a team. It's a team activity. And the, the, the problems to solve are complex enough that actually requires a team. But again, if you read the press, it seems that one person did everything. But that's not really the case.
But that's a problem, isn't it? I mean, it is because if it's stored like that, people think that this is the way it should be, and how then I'm not an entrepreneur, so I shouldn't pursue my idea. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a problem how it's stored today. Mm -hmm. It, it, it re recruits, basically this narrative recruits the wrong kind or just one kind of person. Yeah, yes. I think so. And, yeah. and, you know, we just recognize one kind of entrepreneurship there. I, I wonder, though, if most, most startups fail, Mm -hmm. And most pitches to venture capital capitalists are never funded, for instance. So it's it's maybe for for every Spotify or it's a success story out there, that would be the obvious Swedish example. There's probably a thousand companies, like literally a thousand companies, that didn't make it uh, in that way. Is it rational for states to prioritize new companies over the nurturing of existing companies? Uh, the answer to that is yes, because uh, job growth and job creation comes from the growth of growing firms. Mm. So focusing on large firms is not going to create this job growth that they're looking for. Do you guys agree? I think so. Mm. Yeah. I'm not sure, really, because I think that nowadays we also emphasize innovation, and that's kind of new. If we go back just 100 years, uh, and innovation, a new thing, was not a good thing because it was, it could be, you know, something wrong with it. We could, you know, damage the world as well. So I think we should really, you know, be concerned about this emphasis on innovation. How, how would you frame it instead? What do you mean? Well, I'm, if if we're looking, would, if we were looking at an alternative narrative for the, another story for what what is a good entrepreneur, for instance, how would you? How would you tell that? It's not necessarily somebody, because th the fact is the dominant story is somebody who has a really bright idea, puts together a company and, and becomes rich. But maybe we should measure some other aspects of this. So what's, what, 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 which story would you rather see? Well, you would like to see a, a team picture. It's like a football team. You just, okay, Slatan did four goals, but uh, mm -hmm. you, you would like to see a picture of the whole team. And in many games, he didn't make the four goals. Mm -hmm. Like for in our company, quality assurance, is very important, otherwise we're not allowed to sell anything to anybody, in particular not to the US, when FDA come to check us out. And uh, for example, who is quality assurance responsible? Need, well, that's a lot of credit. Mm. Um, during the US presidential election, Governor Romney and President Obama got into a very interesting tussle about a statement from Romney where he proclaimed that he and his founding partners had built Bain and Company by themselves. Uh, how dependent is an entrepreneur on the state context? So what's the case for, for President Obama's response, response, you didn't build that? Where, w on which side do you guys land in this? <laughs> Did they build it or didn't they? Well, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but everybody has their role to play, mm. uh, including institutions. And, uh, you know, their, their customers, their employees, there are uh, regulatory agencies, and there are politicians as well. And the state has a role uh, in the US, for example, to maintain a, a level playing field, to provide uh, uh, domestic uh, security and tranquility, and to uh, create a system of, of laws and a, whereby contracts are upheld and all those things. No one makes anything by themselves. Mm. Everything is a, a joint effort. And so, uh, you know, so. Uh, but then you're working in Sweden, so wouldn't you say that? Uh, that said, to our international audience, this is a very sort of uh, state-minded state-minded state. Yeah, I try to tell the truth, and that's what happens. Yeah. You end up in Sweden. <laughs> I end up in Sweden. <laughs> end up in Sweden. <laughs> Where do you guys uh, say? How much of it is, is, the, is the environment around the company, and how much is the entrepreneurs? Did you build your companies? Did you build... I, I, I don't. Uh, I, I feel that I, we built it together. Is my my true. You feeling. and your you and your companions, or or you and everybody, you and the world. Me and everybody who who was ever employed in the company and didn't get fired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Karin. Yeah, of course. I mean, the state is really important here. I mean, if 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 we look at entrepreneurship in Sweden, which they think should increase, we can we can just think about. Uh, closing down the public sector, mm. then we would have a lot of entrepreneurs. But would that be good? Would that be a better society? Or would we do better innovations in that case? So I think this kind of thoughts are really necessary in relation to how this is, 
emerging today. Well, then that's the question I'm here to put to you, really. Would it be better? Would it be better if more entrepreneurs were taking it? Because all over, certainly the global north, this is the direction we're going. More and more pr pr private companies in every sector. Uh, from my perspective, no. I don't think that everything should be done in the name of enterprise. I think some issues must and need be solved in other ways. I mean, if we think about the last session today, uh, how to we, save the world? How yeah. to save the world? <laughs> should entrepreneurs do that, or should we do that as a collective? I, I can tell but that I, you guys aren't. I yeah, I don't agree. This, I don't agree. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I don't agree either. I think that this, the, the heart to do something good to solve an important problem is the key to entrepreneurship. And of course, you have bad and good examples, but I think most, mostly good examples. And also, a lot of entrepreneurs like well, Bill Gates and the Pearson family, a lot of others, they really work on the other side, uh, giving money back to charity as well. After becoming mega rich. Yes. I mean, so. Both the things were good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, th I think that, uh, that, uh, that entrepreneurship is one of the most powerful mechanisms that we have at our disposal to create value, to redistribute value, to create value again for customers, for owners, for society in, in general. Uh, um, it, this is not to say that entrepreneurship or any one process uh, can save the world. It needs to be more than one. Mm. But I believe that entrepreneurship can play a substantial role in helping this process along. Are you really saying, though, I'm trying to sort of translate this to sort of everyday language, mm. are you saying that really one of the things that motivates individuals to strive the hardest is the, the, the potential personal wealth uh, that it's involved? Certainly you said that that was a factor in your company, I'm sure. Uh, but and just I, one I, out of four. Yeah, yeah we'll, certainly, we'll, yeah, we'll, but it's one of the factors. When you ask entrepreneurs why, why they start businesses, the three answers are um, uh, freedom, mm -hmm. independence, and money. So it's those, it's those three things. So money, yes, plays a, a role, but it's not alone, independence and freedom, and, and freedom uh, as well. And these days, in the, in the whatever decade we are, you want to call it, that we're in, um, there are lots of entrepreneurs that really are focused on doing something good, by, um, by solving problems, but also giving back in a way that they can create the value in society, perhaps even more directly. And these are like volunteer, we can t I can point mm. to Wikipedias and all these different things where people are volunteering to, to, to give value and create value for others without really taking any uh, uh, personal or direct uh, financial gain. Got it. Well, um, well, I think that's the story you should tell. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the story that's, you know, part of every, every entrepreneur. Yeah. I think that it's just, you know, just like, like you said, I just stumbled into this. I wanted to solve a problem. I saw the potential into doing something new. Um, I mean, sometimes there is not even a reason, but then you need to learn these kind of stories to get um, stakeholders, to get money from the bank, and to present your plan in a nice way. So this is part of the game that you are talking about, part of playing the game. But also, let's be clear that uh, in Sweden, for example, uh, at any one time, there's approximately 4% of the population that is seriously thinking and engaging in some sort of startup activity, 4%. Mm -hmm. So with all of the, uh, the interest, whether it be public or private, in creating entrepreneurs, we still have a long way to go before it's lots of people. It's still only a fraction. How many percent would be good? I think that's an empirical question. 10%. 10%. Well, I don't know. You guys are the are the are the scientists here. Um, yeah, yeah. You, you don't have any numbers for that. No, no, no current projections no. exist. Okay, if I mean we've we've lifted up the model, the alternative model. So we have people who are also driven, who, who are who are less driven by by the financial gain. Does that not make the other kind greedy? I think the people who are driven by another by another motivation, the money, end up the richest in the end, actually. Mm. In many cases, that has been true. Certainly, when you measure happiness in a scientific mm. way. But I mean, also money the in case. the bank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> also money in the bank, you say? Oh. Yeah. Mm. How. Um, I noticed that you guys just dodged the greed question. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Does an entrepreneur have duties and obligations to anybody but her investors?
of course. Whom? Well, to the employees, for sure, mm -hmm. and uh, to, to everybody else in your country and on the whole planet. Yeah, but Terence is teaching that we shouldn't hire people if we can avoid it. So then we don't actually have any employees to, mm. to be responsible to. No, but that's a fewer. Let's say, few, let's, say <laughs> let's say fewer. But that's capitalism. I mean, if we want another system, if we want, I mean, the plan economy where you just employ thousands of people and then you know what should they do afterwards? Is that doesn't seem to work so well. So mm. I think it's more like the next session. Does capitalism work? You want to save your resources, and uh, a human being is a very valuable resource and costs a lot of money. So when you have the work, then you hire. Okay. Do you think mm. that? Do you think that that entrepreneurs? produce more, if we, if we put the growth thing aside, do they produce more innovations? Is an entrepreneurial environment a more innovative environment? Absolutely. Isn't that the definition? Or wasn't that part of the it's definition? Part of the definition. Uh, it, could be, it could be part of, part of the so definition. If but, we, but innovations also yeah. happen in large firms as well. And, and one, of the, one of the differences between uh, the US, for example, and Sweden is that lots of the innovations in Sweden take place in large organizations, where these same innovations might be in startup situations in the, in the US. So, this, so it's lots of innovation, but not always through the mechanism of startup. I'm, I'm trying still to pinpoint the narrative. Karin? I think that I imitation is also a big part of this, uh, because I think they imitate. They, they do it very skillfully. Uh, and I, I mean, doing innovations can take a long time that we can perhaps agree about. Mm -hmm. But imitations is very much part of entrepreneurship as something that gets you know, spread in society. Yeah. If, uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. So if, if we have, um, if we agree that the, that the, if we do agree that, that, the, mm -hmm. the, that the entrepreneurial environment produces uh, innovation, at least since to some part, in part because of the thing, it was freedom and, and financial gain and, and in, in yes. de independence. Shouldn't we, in the academic environment, which is meant to drive uh, innovation mm. uh, for everybody, shouldn't we pour in more freedom and independence and financial gain? Shouldn't we just pay our researchers more? Wouldn't that be the, the most productive for society as a whole? Uh, no. Why? Uh, well, for, I mean, that's what... Uh, our, uh, our minister, uh, Annie Love, is trying to do by giving money to researchers. She believes that uh, innovation is going to be created, and that's a, a fool's errand. Uh, you need to look at what and how are researchers compensated. Uh, and they're compensated based on uh, uh, peer review publications, mm -hmm. uh, not uh, innovations that create uh, value. And so you're going to get a skewed system if you, if you do that. Yeah. But I think peer-reviewed publications, they're really important. That's why I created one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part of what we do. I mean, there is also other ways to look at knowledge. Yeah. So it's not only connected to peer-reviewed papers. Our, our headline today was the battle for entrepreneurs. I guess it's a sort of battle of the hearts and the minds. So, so wealth builders or future builders. So I have the final, are, are they wealth builders? Should they be wealth builders, or should, should, is it more important with the future building part? What do you say, just quickly, everyone? Mats? It goes together. You, you don't want to separate them. You're dodging the question. Karin, wealth <laughs> builders or future builders? Wealth builders. That's what they are. Mm. Terms. Uh, wealth builders. Should they be future builders? OK, I, can I, I, I say you future, future, future builders. <laughs> <laughs> if I should choose. Uh, I think we're getting ready for uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, do, we have, do we have one ready? Please. Step up, young man. Yes. Hello, I'm uh, Evgeny. I have two questions, if I may, right? Briefly, briefly. Uh, first one about uh, entrepreneurial universities. Should they be so? Should they go more market-oriented and produce more entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. And another one, I would ask you to imagine the situation. What if all companies in the world would go social decrease the amount of value they produce for owners and profits and uh, concentrate on social value. Would that, would that solve the, would it make situation better or need something else to, to improve situation globally? Uh, let's take them one at a time. Entrepreneurial universities, should we go in, move in that direction? Well, I think Karin. no. <laughs> and I think that we should emphasize, you know, traditional critical thinking and, and creativity. And from that, entrepreneurship can grow afterwards. 
I think yes. <laughs> I, th I think that is important to inform the students. I, I, I agree with what you said, but I think it's important to inform the students about those possibilities because I didn't realize that as a student and I met one entrepreneur. He was 58 years old and then uh, that was when he started and he created several very successful companies and he said to me, why didn't I realize this before I turned 58? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we should tell the students about the opportunities. And I would say there, there's room for all types of educational institutions. Okay, then for the second question, should, what if all companies in the world uh, focus less on producing wealth for the owners and more on social values, not socialization? We're not saying, what if we had a total communist system? We're saying, what if, if we just focused more of the energy and possibly the profits to the collective, to the greater good? Would that work? What would happen then? Would companies just stop being productive? I think what we need, yeah. need is clear rules is very important for entrepreneurs. If, if you, I think that's, that's what you need from, from society. And then you pay back with the taxes and uh, through the, those rules. You follow the rules and then you pay back that way. Regulate me is what you're saying. You guys agree? To a point. Yeah. How do you feel about this utopian vision? Or is it a dystopian vision to you perhaps? Yeah, I think, I think that uh, building an entrepreneurial organization that produces products and services that actually meets the needs of the customer is very challenging. And to do that, you can, I mean, it's very difficult to be an entrepreneur. And there needs to be incentives, uh, not all financial. And I'm not sure there'd be enough incentives to drive people to put the effort to make this sort of organization successful over time. All right, thank you very much. Do we have another question from the audience? Yes, please. And please state your name and perhaps your university. Uh, my name is Mikael Olsson, and I study design and mechanical engineering here at KTH. Um, and my question is, you know, we, we are here touched upon um, uh, that you know, 15 years ago there was this internet boom and there was a lot of money involved in that business and a lot of problems to be solved. But where is that area today? Like, where should I get involved? Yeah. He wants to get in on the action. Where's the action? <laughs> you oh, should, you I, should, go ahead. Yeah, you should be part of the SSES courses. Yeah. <laughs> that could be one arena. Um, so that's where I make what, the money. Where, yeah. I, I think what, you should what, yeah? look around in your private life as my, what, what ir problems really irritate you. Try to solve them. You know, you're probably not alone. Probably a lot of other people irritate, get irritated by the same problems. That's mm -hmm. my clue. If you're interested in, in, in ICT uh, and you think you missed the boom, the products and many of the products and services that were offered during this time, we weren't ready for. Mm -hmm. If you look at magazines such as Industry Standard, you go back to some of these magazines there, there are lots of products and services that were meant to solve problems that we weren't ready to solve yet, that we are ready to solve now. So a good place to look for potential problems to solve are in those magazines from the mid-90s. Uh, Medical technology. Sweden is a good brand and the aging population, everybody will get sick. Yeah, I, I like how you just suggested to go look for innovation through imitation, actually. So we're, we're back at what Karin just said. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I suppose. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have a Skype question as well. Let's see, do we have a Skype question? Oh, that's, uh, we've, we've lost the Skype question, unfortunately. I was too slow. Do we have another question from the audience? Yes, we do. There you go, Seven. sir. Please. Uh, let's see. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm a student from KTH. My name is Hong Yi. I'm studying system control robotics. And I have a question about, uh, yeah, you just talked about the difference of uh, entrepreneurship in the United States and in, in Sweden. And you said that uh, the entrepreneurship in the United States is usually take in uh, startup, startup company. It's a small company, and uh, in Sweden, it's usually in big companies. So, yeah, uh, could you tell me more about this? Which is a better one, you think, or make analyze? Yes, hmm? entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship, which is superior? Uh, yeah, I think I'm not sure that's his question. I think his question was uh, innovation. Is it better for innovation to take place within the larger firm or through the startup? Is that is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that there's a, a better. Uh, I don't think that it's. I don't think it's one uh, versus the other. I think both of them work. I think both of them co uh, complement each other. I think that you uh, you you get a different structure uh, of the economy 
uh, with one versus the other. But I, don't, I think the, the important thing is that the innovation, which is the commercialization of an invention, really solves a problem, really cures a pain, and really meets a need. That's the most important thing. We need both. Thank you. Yes, yes. thank you. Now we are ready for a Skype question, I think. Hello? Hello, yes. Hello, please state Hi, your name. name. Yes. Hi, thanks for, uh, thanks for contacting me. And uh, I, my name is uh, Steph Dennis. I, I uh, graduated from a business school and I brought up two startups. I really uh, like the show, first of all. And my question is, um, what, are the key, what are the top five key factors enabling entrepreneurs to compete with multinational companies on today's web, web 2.0? Thank you for your question. Top five. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty... I just happen to have a list right here. <laughs> that's a pretty rough, pretty specific question. We'll see what we can do. Okay, we need... So what are some factors? Let's start if we can see if we can find five that enable startups to compete with multinationals, especially Speed. for the Web 2.0 context. Speed and flexibility. Speed and flexibility. Yeah. I think you need to, to think that you are smarter than they are in spite that it's only you and they are so big, and you need to be right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. What do you say, say? Do you have anything to add? Yeah, you, can, you, you can't outspend them, but you might be able to outthink them. Hmm. Is the, okay. there, the part of the entrepreneurial narrative seems to be, uh, certainly part of the, 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 the startup narrative is that startups aren't set in their ways and startups are more willing to fail as well as part of the process. Is that true? Does that help uh, relative to multinationals, for instance? Or is that a myth? No, I mean, I think, the, I think you have to be willing to fail. In order to take these leap, leaps of faith that you need to take, you have to be willing to fail. And because of the resource endowment of large organizations, they may be less likely to take that leap. So smaller firms can fill that gap. So that helps. Thank you very much for your question. Good Thank luck. you. Good luck. Yeah. We have another question, I think, on Skype. Do we indeed have another question? Just a moment. The excitement of the excitement of being live. That's what it is. They claim that we do. Hello? Do we? Just a moment. There we are. We have audio at least. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yes, we can. You're on Crosstalks. Welcome. What is your name, please? Hi, my name is Constantinos. I call from Cyprus. Hello. And can you hear me? Yes. yes. What is your yeah. question, and, please? And my question, I mean, you have uh, talked about a lot, a lot of interesting uh, stuff, ideas, and material, but you haven't touched upon the issue of uh, failure. And uh, I was wondering how can, uh, you know, to, how can this be embraced in a society in order to help, uh, you know, more entrepreneurs uh, function? Yeah. Thank you. That's a great question. Karin starts. Well, I think we have this American researcher talking about failing forward. And then you can see, you know, the need of a society that functions. Uh, so, so I think that's part of the story, that we should have those structures to make it possible also to fail. Because failure is part of, you know, becoming successful. You need sometimes to fail uh, quite a lot of times. So failing forward is the idea well, of learning through your... His kind of proverb, yeah, that's yes. one way to see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matt? I think the great uh, consolation if you fail is that at least we tried. At least we tried. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it it, it, a lot of people don't did try. Yeah. 99, well, 96% didn't try. 4 96% didn't percent. try, yeah. Yeah, fail, fail fast and fail often. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, fail I fast never and fail, fail often. But then we're back at the thing. Will the, maybe that's what something we should add to the narrative of the entrepreneur then. Because, of course, again, with the hero entrepreneur, we only see the one who are astonishing successes. What about putting failure into the equation? Would that help or would, that, would it make us braver or would it make us scared or more scared? Braver and smarter. Braver and smarter. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that, uh, again, if you looked at all of these uh, heroic figures that do get the press, they have plenty of failures, but they just don't get covered. Yeah. I think that if you fail, sometimes you are met that well. Then that's, that person is not an entrepreneur. So, <laughs> so that's kind of the tricky uh, thing about this narrative. So either you 
you create success and then you're an entrepreneur or you fail and you're not. I think the, yeah. the risk of failure is, is uh, exaggerated wildly. At least in Sweden, you have such a safety network, and if you fail, so what? You will still sit here, drink coffee with your friends, and uh, try another thing, get a job. And it's, it's counted as a merit. Uh, the, the, the tide is turning. Yeah. 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 I tried my yeah. startup, yeah. but I failed. I mean, that's a pretty good merit, actually. There is a cultural yeah. difference, uh, US versus Sweden versus Europe, in terms of uh, failure. Uh, and especially in, in, in the valley and in the areas where entrepreneurship is hot in the U.S. and that failure is seen as a, uh, a badge of honor. And in fact, if you haven't gone through a failure, you're not ready for success. Yeah, yeah we used to say, I'm, I'm old enough to have actually been in the IT boom, uh, the, been working during, during that era. And then I remember people said, well, if you haven't, if, if, if you haven't had a startup go bust, mm -hmm. you're not actually an entrepreneur. But mm -hmm. that narrative has completely disappeared, certainly in, in Europe in the last, in the last 10 years. Mm. There is, but I think maybe that's also a sign that that the idea of the entrepreneur, the the story of the entrepreneur, has becoming uh, is is becoming disconnected from the reality of the job, mm. in some way. Yeah. yeah mm. But we don't want to fail. We don't want to do that, really. Uh, no. But we we are. I mean, we, we are must. failing, but we don't want to. The majority <laughs> will. I, again, the majority of startups will. We all yeah. will now and then. And yeah. I just can say, I, I started an IT company, and we were about to sign this agreement the 12th of September 2001. That was not a good day to sign, you know, for venture capital. No. So I think that also uh, timing is part of the story, and we seldom talk about that. It's either you are an entrepreneur or you're not. No, exactly. You can you can fail for external now reasons. From Skype, but one more advice: be yeah. lucky. Be yeah. lucky, yeah. <laughs> so, and thank you, Konstantinos, for the question. We have time for another question from the audience. There you go. And please state your name and your uh, uh, affiliation. Hello, everyone. My name is Ilya. I'm a graduate from Yen Chopping University. Hey. If it's possible, I have two short questions. First one, uh, I'm really interested how our uh, guests define the difference between businessman and actual entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. If any difference, and uh, if it is, what kind of it? And uh, the next question is, do you really think that it's possible to learn person, to learn student, to be entrepreneur at university or in business school? Because neither Steve Jobs or Bill Gates actually finished these entrepreneur courses, I think. Thank you. Very good question. So first, the businessman uh, versus entrepreneur. Is this the same? A good businessman is an, an entrepreneur. A bad businessman is not an entrepreneur. Do you agree? I think that's pretty, that's pretty hard. What about, the, what about the people looking long term? What about the board of directors looking at the horizon, keeping companies alive, making them grow? Organically, aren't they good businessmen? Sounds like sound business to me. No. They're just dodging the question, no? no. Very well. Let's <laughs> move to the second question from Ilya. Yeah. Uh, question can we teach easy. entrepreneurialism in, yeah. at university? Yeah, that's a silly yeah. question. And we get what? It, it's a silly question. Why? Uh, because uh, <laughs> can I teach you how to play basketball better? And the answer is absolutely. Can I make you Michael Jordan? No. Ah. So I can Are you sure about that one? Yes. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, I can teach you, how, teach you uh, about project management and marketing and, and, and identifying potential business opportunities and those sorts of things. And I can make you an entrepreneur. You can have some success. That doesn't mean you're going to go and create Apple or, uh, or, or Microsoft. That's where we're going to have to end. It's possible to, to get better, but perhaps you also need to be in the 4% to begin with to really make it big. <laughs> thank you, Ilya, and thank you so much to the panel. Karin Berilund, Terence Brown, and Matt Danielson. Thank you. Thank you. We're talking about innovation. I wish someone had invented a time machine so we could extend this session, but unfortunately, we are out of time. But or time reversal, that would help as well, exactly. Mm -hmm. But don't worry, we will be back in a few minutes at exactly 6 p.m. CET to talk about the economy, or more specifically, to answer the question, how can we save capitalism? You don't want to miss that. In the meantime, please continue to ask questions of our guests, uh, who will now move backstage to chat with you on crosstalks.tv. We will be right back. Thank you. <laughs>